there. Or we're an action. <laughs> Linda and I were just talking before about you know uh, how it how it comes that um, that an event like this uh, can make us both feel very excited and anxious at the same time. And and I said, I guess Linda, it's like I, I'm quite accustomed to public speaking, and you know, I guess it's like somebody put a needle in my hand uh, and and uh, some beautiful thread and uh, some wonderful fabric and said, sew something right now. And then wear it on stage for a gathering of your peers and people that you respect and admire. So, <laughs> how's it feeling, uh, Linda, now that we're up here? All right, okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. We will get there because there's so much to tell you about in this incredible project that um, that uh, Antonia has so eloquently described to you, and it did all start here. Uh, I think that the idea of unsiloed arts is really what drives my career right now. Uh, I'm a classical musician and so all the classical musicians in the room, uh, all the people that have worked very hard at their, their art, their craft, will know that it is about um, about isolating yourself for a certain period of life, many hours in every day to practice your instrument or instruments. And it can be, as I say, very isolating. And that's really kind of, uh, it's counterintuitive really to arts practice as it is meant to be. The arts are not meant to be isolated from one another. The arts, for the Buruanam, who've poured their knowledge into this land for something like 2,000 generations, 2,000 generations, the arts were a way of knowing the world and giving meaning to everything in it. And what really, I think, what drives me on in a project like this and other work that I'm doing at the moment, yes, as a composer, also as a singer, is that this is the traditional practice of the indigenous nations of this continent, but, but that's also the traditional practice of your ancestors. Now that may be further back for you than it is for me, because of course indigenous cultures are the longest continuing, the longest continuing cultures in the world. But somewhere in your ancestry, somewhere in your family history, singing, and painting, and dancing, and weaving art that your life depended upon. It was part of your daily practice. It's the way that your ancestors knew the world and gave meaning to everything in it. And so a project such as this that has so many layers and dimensions, it's difficult to, to sum it up succinctly, wouldn't you say, Linda? Definitely. Have, you, have you had to try to describe it over the phone to someone? Oh, definitely. Or, definitely. Or, yeah. It's very hard to use because it so, has so many layers and it means so much. Mm. Yes, it's difficult. But I think Jan Green Burns, the, the journal of the spectrum, really wrote very well about it. She got the gist of it. I think she explained it very well because it's, it um, yeah, it's, it's, it's very many, many layers. Yes. It, it needed all two pages of that, or did, of that double yeah. page spread. It might have been longer, I, I can't remember now. But, but that's not a reason what, uh, to not do something. Mm. Uh, so much of our lives, the nuance is taken out of it. The nuance is taken out of our lives at every turn. And, and you're here tonight because you value nuance. You value the arts and that's what gives you the nuance. And that nuance gives you an understanding in life that you otherwise would not have. That is why it's so important that the arts are embedded in education at the very very beginning and all the way through the education for our children. It's why it's so important that no matter what the obstacles, we must support the arts because it gives the nuance. It gives the nuance in our, um, in our thinking and in our daily lives. Now, I've got PowerPoints here and I don't normally use PowerPoints, so I'm just having a look. What's the next one? Well, Let's, let's have a look here. This is what's in the front gallery, and I know that some of you have not yet been to the front gallery, so I would really encourage you after our, uh, our Q&A session this evening that you make your way there to see three of what will be ultimately a collection of ten 
And I didn't say it was 10 when we started out. <laughs> I think, what did I say to you on that phone? It is 10 so far. I haven't, I haven't finished my conversation to be able to tell you. It started out as 9 no. Have you had, ever had a, a commission like that before? Was it that what, what do you? Yeah, yeah in terms nice. of this yeah. response. No, 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 no not, not. I've worked with um, other artists, but not in this capacity, mm -hmm. not to respond to another artist, tapestry, song, composition, everything. And I thought, oh, Deborah yeah. asked me to do the first this idea, oh, that's good, that's very exciting. I like the sound of that, yeah, yeah, okay. <laughs> <laughs> said, oh, I thought to myself, it's talking about the first one, which was catching breath. Yeah, I thought, oh, yeah, I can do that. Yes, yeah. yeah. Well, no. <laughs> <laughs> well, there was a story to that. I'm just going to go back, sorry, Adrian, who beautifully put together uh, uh, this uh, PowerPoint for me today. I'm not doing the job, but uh, there on the right hand side, on my yeah, the right hand side is the first gown made by Linda Britton that I ever wore. And uh, it was for the opening of the new wing of the National Gallery, uh, the new Indigenous wing of the National Gallery in Canberra. I can't remember what year that was. Was it 2015 or something? Oh, I think it was a long time ago. But I can really can't. I tried to remember so I could recall to talk to you about that, but no. But I do remember someone said to me the other day they were actually at that event and they saw you. They came into the gallery and apparently you were I was, I was up. She said, the top absolute vision in the frock and you were singing in that. It was just something she said. I think also people were really relieved to come in from outside because proceedings started outside in August in Canberra. <laughs> Who thought of that? I don't know. So they were very relieved to be led in by the then Governor General, Quinton Bryce. And yes, I was up the top singing uh, the first piece actually that I ever wrote in language, which was a song called Dalimana Gamarada, which was um, which was written as a commission for the opening ceremony of the Sydney, uh, uh, the, the Sydney Olympic Games. But I remember us talking then, that first time, we hadn't met in person, but we were talking about um, the inspiration of uh, the Red Desert, and when you fly over uh, the Red Desert, uh, you see these these ripples of sand, and um, I think the pleating, the whole gown is pleated. We pleated yeah. twenty meters, I think, Tom's here, something like that. Twenty or thirty meters of <laughs> Tom, do you remember each and every <laughs> meter? <laughs> Not into that. Yeah. So that was the very first time that Linda and I um, collaborated, and and I knew straight away when I when I saw the embassy tapestries that I wanted to write music that would respond to each of them individually and that it would be necessary to actually go to each of the countries and to visit the tapestries because uh, whilst you can see them in the book Many Hands, which is the anniversary publication by Extreme Tapestry Workshop, and it's, it's magnificent in the book, really it's the three-dimensional dimensionality of the tapestries that takes your breath away and you can see one being created here behind uh, where we're seated and so um, I knew that I would be traveling to a number of the countries where the tapestries were uh, uh, residing and uh, Tony my partner who's here this evening and I were giving recitals for uh, DFAT in a number of uh, embassies overseas so we thought right we're going to marry this opportunity up but as a soprano, I think that uh, the question that I've had uh, more times than just about anything else except apart from what are you singing tonight is what are you wearing tonight? <laughs> what are you wearing? Who are you wearing? And uh, I knew that I wanted Linda to be involved in this because uh, Linda has uh, a strong relationship to other uh, creative and theatrical uh, enterprises in Victoria. Uh, particularly through Cam Menzies, you've had a long yes, relationship yes. with Cameron, uh, who's a director for um, the Victorian Opera, and uh, and I and I knew that this was a relationship that we could develop. Not only because people ask me what will I be wearing, but because here's an opportunity. As you mentioned, there's an artist, the original painting on which uh, each tapestry is based. There's the tapestry and the weavers who have a voice in this as well. And thank you for being here, weavers, this evening. And also, then, of course, there's the music. But the response beyond that, I was interested in what 
there could be as a response beyond those elements. And, uh, and I think, um, well, what we have so far is, is a pretty stunning collection, beautiful to wear. And yes, the first one was Singapore. <laughs> We're laughing because we know there's a story we're going to tell you. Just so you know, this is the um, entire tapestry collection. This is all 10. Uh, and the artworks are by, um, uh, in the Holy See, there's a collection of artists. And uh, the Holy See is, um, uh, let me see, up the top, it's the, it's the uh, last one in the row there with the beautiful blue circles. And uh, that represents the Canyon Stock Route. And I visited uh, the Holy See uh, late last year and spent a whole day in the room with that tapestry composing. And that was very, uh, very generous of uh, Her Excellency Melissa Hinchman to have me there that day and her staff. Um, next to that, uh, and that's by uh, a collection of artists, Clifford Brooks, Jeffrey James, Putapari. Uh, Tom Walford, uh, Peter Tinker, Richard Yukonbari, Jakamara, Charlie Wallabai, uh, Jungara, Helicopter, Jungara, and Patrick Jungara. And uh, that has a magnificent story that we won't have time to tell you about tonight, but uh, certainly there will be an opportunity. You can also see next to that the book Andrew's Cat Catching Breath, um, Naomi Hobson. Uh, is the is the one that's been created right now on the loom? How exciting! Underneath Naomi's, we have the um, Patrick Mungmung, and that hangs in the uh, Australian Embassy to uh, Ireland in in Dublin. And then uh, next to that, I, I have to say one of my favourite things was spending time with this next tapestry in that middle row there, which is. Uh, is hanging in the Australian Embassy to Italy. Of course, there are two embassies in Rome, the one to Italy and the one to the Holy See, as the Holy See is its own state. And um, that incredible uh, uh, Nancula, uh, Nancula Watson uh, painting that inspired that uh, second image there. there, there are so many threads there are so many threads, there are so many stitches, there are so many moments in that tapestry, in that original painting, but spending the day with that tapestry revealed something that a photograph alone could not do. Of course, if I'd spoken to the weavers who, who worked on it, they could have told me that there's one thread of purple that sits alone uh, on the right-hand side of that tapestry, one thread alone that represents one particular journey and to a musician that opens up a world of possibility in composition. It's already so with me. The next one is um, hanging in the, uh, the Australian residence of the ambassador in Paris. And uh, this, uh, this, particular, um, this particular artwork by Elizabeth Marks Nakamara is called uh, Creek Bed. And I've just finished the composition for Creek Bed and it will have unusually a, a sort of preliminary premiere in, at Iwaki uh, the Sunday after next with Melbourne Ensemble. Uh, as part of my residency with MSO this year, uh, I was invited to have one of the <coughs> Melbourne Ensemble projects uh, uh, composed on the Melbourne Ensemble, which is a septet. And uh, I will be singing uh, in the Pintuvi language. All of these pieces have language with them as well. Uh, another very important layer. And uh, I encourage you to get along to that concert. Uh, it's during the daytime at Iwaki. Trevor Nichols, uh, you'll recognise his work. It's so um, iconic under the Kimberley sky. And that hangs in the embassy in uh, Washington. Then underneath that, uh, the third and final row, we have the New Delhi uh, work by Nanya Manamangani. Uh, an excellent uh, a study, a detail from a much larger painting, which I'll talk about later. And uh, next to that, then we have the Pedro Wanyamiri uh, Hukamani poles. Uh, I saw this in China. Uh, how lucky was I to go to China when you could still go to China? I'm sure this can still go to China. It is winter in the Northern Hemisphere, everyone. Uh, and uh, but. 
I was able to see this tapestry not only on the wall, but the um, the ambassador was very kind to take it off the wall and out of a secured area so I could take photos of it. And finally, the Daisy Andrews. People are going to ask me um, if if I have a favourite dress. Do you? I, do you have I I have favourite moments from each of the dresses. You know, I can't. I, I always the the um, the first the first dress is always going to be an important and a, and a, and a, uh, a very special yeah, catching breath. Yeah. yeah. Do you want to tell the story, why, Linda? Like, what did I do to you with that? Well, you know, she's a very very busy girl, obviously. Of course, gives me much time to do anything, really. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, so I said, oh, I need this dress for Singapore. Okay. I think we had, we had a month, maybe not even that. I think we had a month, but I happened to be. But you were away. I was in, I was in <laughs> WA for the entire you know, the time. Right. So I had to guess. <laughs> we haven't seen Deborah for quite some time, have we? No, no, she does. No, nothing. And so we kind of had to guess. What she looks like now. Okay. Yeah. So we did. We we, we get kind of guessed it really. Yeah. I was oh, actually then I was doing a show for WA Ballet, and nothing incentivizes you to lose weight <laughs> as much as working with ballet dancers every day, every day, every day. So I had I had lost a bit of weight, but I think you sent you sent me a, a guide to how to measure. I did. Yeah, you sent you a guide. And you I did yourself. Did you have fail miserably? Yeah. I don't know. I can't. Oh, I oh, knew well. that I was taller than me. Yeah. I also put a yeah. mini skirt. I don't know <laughs> how I got so lucky on you there. <laughs> anyway, we made it and then um, we said, well, now you, now you have to bring it up to Singapore because um, you've got to perform. So we, um, uh, that's what I did. We went up, flew up to Singapore to meet you. And I think it was equivalent to 3 o'clock in the morning that we got there. And uh, there was a have to come over, we're rehearsing. And then we've got to do a film, you know, an interview. <laughs> uh, what if the dress doesn't fit? I'm worried. What if the dress doesn't fit? Then what if the dress doesn't fit? <laughs> something else no. that you can wear. Oh, yeah. actually, I did bring the blue. We did. I, yeah. I brought the blue. Just I always have. <laughs> so my lunch got there. travels in it's separate. Yeah. Yeah. My uh, dresses separate. travel in there separate. Threw it on you, and, and it was it was absolutely perfect. perfect. I wonder if we've got that image oh, somewhere. I've gone out of order. Now. This is why I don't. Um, uh, there it is. Mm. So there's the gown. Uh, and it was very hard to do this one. I'm going to work backwards. So this is the first hit. There we are. Mm. Linda's been in Singapore for to get from the airport. <laughs> and, um, and and there she is throwing it on. And I'm delighted. She's happy. So I'm, very, I'm very, very happy. She's got a frock too. And that was literally the dress rehearsal. We were, we were going into rehearsal with the musicians. Now, as Antonia mentioned before, for each of the ten works, there's an ensemble from Australia. Uh, there they are. I knew they'd start while I tell you what, Miss Dunham. Sorry, if you're wondering what I'm here against, the Grand Prix. So oh, how they managed to travel here from yeah. Yeah. I'm using that as the benchmark of how serious it actually is. So, um, yeah, let's get sensible. So here we are. We're about to perform the very next evening. Uh, I couldn't come home for the fittings because my dear, dear sister-in-law and Tony's sister, Susie, um, her journey with cancer ended right before we were meant to uh, be in Singapore. And in fact, catching breath and this dress and everything about that occasion and the support that I got from the artists and the people around me in this project at a time when we were grieving for someone who was only the same age as me, with three beautiful children, all at university, and um, a really aggressive cancer had claimed her life. And in fact, it was just after Anzac Day, and Tony and I um, were in Perth, fortunately, with the family, uh, and we were there for, for to farewell Susie. And virtually on the way home from the wake, we were communicating with people in Singapore about this about this project. Susie, um, you know, I pay my respects to her. She was a musician, she was a music teacher. Uh, she um, was a much beloved teacher in Bunbury in, in, uh, in WA. And uh, I, I could hear Susie's voice in my ear, you're going to do this performance. The show has to go on. And she would have said that. But uh, to this day, darling, having played that concert, 
um, Tony, of course, is my accompanist, my partner in music and life. Having played that concert, um, it really is a credit to the strength that uh, that a spirit of somebody like Susie can leave in the world and you can draw on that spirit, and we did. And so that dress and everything about that occasion very special to me because it was at a time when um, when loss, we were surrounded by loss, but then we were reconnecting to what enables us, uh, uh, the spirit of somebody to live on in us, and, and music can do that and it does it. And that is that dress. You know, I was talking about the big red dress from the, the National Gallery, but there was another dress. I'm just going to take us back now. Um, there, there, there was this dress. Um, that's not dress. <laughs> there was this dress. And um, this is a fabric that came from Tiwi. Uh, I think we've got some photos of we Do you yeah. want to tell the story? And I'll find the photo. I think it was my first video. Uh, many years ago, one long, long time ago, about 79, 1979, I met. Um, so uh, I just don't quite remember who they were. They had come down from the Tiwi Islands to, I think, promote the art gallery. They were in this very small screen printing. Um, Business, I think, industry back in there, and they come down to show what they were doing. But it was kind of, I think they were just, perhaps Steve, who my sister who came with me, may remember it was kind of just a, a souvenir. But they made some sort of garments, I mean, they had a little workshop up there, and they said, Oh, why don't you come up? Why don't you come up? Well, that's interesting. 1979. 1979. Can I interrupt while you're getting to the, did everybody see? The front page of Spectrum this weekend. Mm -hmm. Okay, so where it's at now, design, Indigenous design. So mm -hmm. 1979, mm -hmm. making, making. So I don't think either of us even had that, that idea at the time, done anything or even gone there. No. In fact, we weren't allowed us to go there. We had to have special permission mm -hmm. to go there. Uh, we were not allowed to take any photographs. It was all very um, undercover. Not undercover, but no photographs ever. Um, Except for these two that we've got. Well, yes, we never put them up. We never put them up publicly, so they were just for my photos. But uh, Devon and I thought, my sister and I thought, oh my no, god, no, this would be an adventure. So we took off, went to Alice Spring, and we should look at the Red Centre a little bit, we thought, before we go on. So we got the mini mark. A mini mark? Did not have windows in the middle of the house? And we tried out to the desert. <laughs> <laughs> Gosh, I knew nothing about anything. You would never get the red dust out of anything. <laughs> well, that's right. Anyway, so that was very exciting. Oh, I forgot. So then we, we went off to uh, Bethesda in a little weedy, weedy plane, landed in the middle of a paddock, I think, and the boys in the truck, which we popped in at the back, took us to the gallery. And uh, there we met you know, the, the screen printers and we set to work with. Um, you know, what can we do? What will we do? Because I had this idea we should print on fabric and make garments and make clothes. Is that fabric that Catherine is wearing? Um, that's Catherine Freeman? Yes. It is. No, we did. Because I mean, back many years later, that's from later, that's mm -hmm. from yeah, yeah, years after. Not so long ago. But, yeah. but the thing is, it's, it's, like, it's like I've gone to the embassies around the world uh, to see these. Have. You had to be there. It sounds mm -hmm. like you had to have that experience of being there. I had to be there and to see them work and do the street with their the indigenous art. The, um, um, I don't know, it's just a kind of extraordinary and very um, confronting for us because we've not, not known anything about Yeah, Catherine. Art, well, the, Catherine culture in that really permanent form, exactly, that the fabric can be, but it's well made, like a minute written. Uh, capturing culture, which is really experiential, yeah, um, that that is new. That's only a that's only a few hundred years old because mm -hmm. culture, uh, you know, it resides here and here and in the spirit. And so uh, this idea of painting on something you can take home and buy from a wonderful gallery or put on a, you know, a gown that's that's kind of new. So it shows how things are evolving. Well, yes, yeah. and I don't think they they didn't quite know how to take a next step with it. Actually, made, made some things, but they were not. They couldn't make the dresses. Yeah. So we, we what's, what's this one? Oh, this is interesting because we came back with um, some prints, and at that time I must have been working in the Woolcock, which we know as the Woolcock today, and 
and they had just um, developed what we know as cotton wool. So it was the first time that wool fabric had been made to for um, um, summer, you know, right? Chancy summer, mm -hmm. and it hadn't been done before. So this, was, this cloth was very new. So they were interested in what we were doing and supported us, and we went back again, and they helped the uh, screen printers do this printing on this fabric. Thought this was a, a nice idea to promote to Australian wool, you know, different and inventive. So this is what we did when we went there. But unfortunately, politically, I think at that time it was very difficult. So we really didn't get the support. We didn't get it out into the. This was the Herald Sun. They ran a story on it, but it didn't go very far. We had a lot of barriers. A lot of um, it was not embraced as such. Um, it was a bit disappointing. So what decade are we talking? Is this, is this in the 80s or? No, I think we got to that in the 80s. I think it's yeah. over the 70s or 80s. Yeah, that kind of time. And that was. Um, so, anyway, we left it and uh, left it there. And then, not so many years ago, recently, we, uh, I made, well, they made contact with me again and we set up about doing printing. And I thought, this time I would like to do it on silk because no, I've never done it on silks. Chiffon silks. So, that would be very beautiful, very good chill. So um, we managed to do that with uh, and Deborah's skirt is part of what that collection's from. So it's a magnificent green. I think with the lights on you don't have to see mm. how the depth of it. That photo on the left there, Vicky Sullivan, uh, a well-known um, uh, portrait painter here, in, in uh, an artist here in Victoria, uh, I was posing precariously uh, on, on a tube bed. <laughs> Uh, down at Rye, I think it was, uh, and uh, that um, that portrait has uh, uh, it's is quite an amazing portrait. And the one on the right, I'm also on a cliff. You can't tell, but those little shrubs behind me—they're giant trees. And the photographer's saying, "Just take another step back. Just another step back." And as the wind caught that beautiful uh, silk, uh, I was thinking. It's not a parachute, so, <laughs> and so here we here we are with the first three of the woven song uh, uh, pieces, and I think um, and Adriana is going to tell me that I might have missed uh, I don't know slide number nine. Oh, it's the next one. We've actually even got some sound from Singapore. I think uh, it might come up a little recording. We're very fortunate, ABC. Um, <laughs> A snippet of the beginning of the woven song for catching breath. That work uh, in its entirety, um, as all of the compositions are, are around about nine minutes in length. And uh, I find it very difficult to talk when music is playing, but it's going to, uh, yeah, that's going to find it. So that's a recording from just a few weeks ago that ABC made, and they very kindly made the, the, um, the recording available to me so you get a feeling of, of the, the urgency in this piece. And you can hear us calling out, my name, my name, my name. This work uh, by... Uh, the original artwork by Brooke Andrew is uh, called Catching Breath. And when you see the tapestry and when you see the original artwork, it really does make a breath catch. Um, in fact, you can look over to uh, my left, your right, depending on where you're sitting, and there's a whole storyboard about the catching breath uh, and the weaving of the tapestry and the technique that had to be developed here at the Australian Tapestry Workshop. Uh, in order to create the veil that is over the face of the warrior. This uh, comes from an original uh, paint, uh, an original photograph in uh, Brooke's extensive collection of photographs from the early 1900s, where the stamp on the back of that photograph uh, says Cunningham 1900 Armadale. Now, at, sometimes we've assumed that Cunningham was the photographer, uh, and at other times we assume that Cunningham is a name that's been attributed to the warrior, but 
Whichever it happens to be, it is not this warrior's name. He had a name, and that most certainly wasn't Cunningham. And so this piece talks to the, uh, speaks to the very dangerous practice of the undifferentiated other. Uh, now we're seeing that applied in this um, so-called pandemic right now. The undifferentiated other is how uh, humans allow themselves to commit atrocities on other humans. The undifferentiated, the undifferentiated other. And by taking this this man, this warrior, in this original photograph, by taking away his actual name, we dehumanise him to a certain extent. And uh, it's a very dramatic piece of music that goes with that. Some of the beautiful detail that we saw before uh, is there in this, what's the fabric there? Again, oh, it's a silk duchess satin. So the fabric that was used there in the 50s to up gowns before gowns. Because it's it's got the um, texture, of, it's very fluid and it's like sculpture, so you can sort of sculpt it. So, was that part of the reason for yes, choice of that? That's right, because I, I looked at the veil and reading the story and the veil and its significance, what would you do? Very hard to, to make it down to that kind of um, painting and image, that story, but we thought that wrapping in it would be kind of significant as of the veil of, over its face and keep it simple and just use the colours of the painting was probably what this, and I just felt that. Felt right to do it that way, really. I think. It is an exquisite gown to wear, believe me. And I can see there on the far right the, the, one of the original concepts yes. where you've taken the part of the actual. Uh, I did, I thought you had to see where we. we yeah, well, do we take part of the painting and actually make that as the dress? And I thought, well, no, I don't think that's. It shouldn't be that obvious. It should really reflect the story what is, and what could happen. We create our own response to it, which is that's what we did there. And it's kind of the, the thoughts I have with each dress now, how we proceed with it. The playing of the music is really just the tip of a very large um, uh, process, a very large process indeed, and, and process is so much more important really than outcome. The outcome will take care of itself if the process is right. The relationship that you developed with that workshop in Tiwi mm. and those people that you developed a relationship over a number of years mm. there. Mm. Uh, the relationship that we've developed yes. Uh, yes. and the talking about these artworks and the layers of meaning and applying an Indigenous lens to what we're looking at here. Yes, certainly it's an Indigenous artwork, but how you as the non-Indigenous viewer views that artwork, it's helpful to actually place the Indigenous lens over that artwork to bring it into focus uh, for a moment. And then you'll have your own response, and that's entirely as it should be. Right. But an informed response is a desirable thing. Mm -hmm. These ones we saw before from our very happy first encounter. We were off to India next, and I must say I loved the process of, um, of bringing together this gown, Linda, and the wonderful work that Matt Preet I know people are looking at my shirt. This is also, yes. I think, uh, this is, has also been uh, yeah. made from our uh, uh, studio in India. But with, uh, yeah. yeah, yeah. And uh, this is in response to um, uh, Nandima Nupangadi's magnificent untitled work. Untitled because it's part of a much larger work. And I absolutely love this. This, uh, the original painting, was painted by a number of women from Kiwakara. Kiwakara, we are as remote from Kiwakara as you can possibly be, I reckon. We are something like, well, a, 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 an airplane to, to Alice Springs, hop into, not only, uh, <laughs> hop into a four wheel drive, for goodness sake. And then you'd have to drive 19 hours west to get to Kiwakara. And you'd still be in the Northern Territory. I love this country. And the colour of the the colour of the ground that seeped into the canvas, I love this. This is the detail that Australian Tapestry Workshop goes to in their colour. The colour of the ground, that red dirt that seeped into the back of that canvas, is interpreted in the threads of the lighter colours in the actual tapestry. It's magnificent. 
But the entire painting was sold at auction. It was painted to be sold at auction to raise money for a kidney dialysis machine. The Western diet being so out of step with the very, uh, the very succinct diet of the people of that area. Uh, kidney disease is unfortunately rampant. And uh, so through Purple House, uh, they were able to raise money for Purple House to provide two kidney dialysis machines uh, from the sale of that one painting. And this is a detail from the original painting. Now, the text that I've selected for this work uh, comes from the uh, United Nations Human uh, Declaration of Human Rights, Article 27. And so I've named the piece Article 27, which states that everyone should be free to participate in their life, uh, the cultural life of their community and that they should be able to benefit from advances in scientific technology. <laughs> that was that painting right there, articulated in Article 27. This gown though, Linda, we, we've, actually, we've actually made some modifications since this. We have. Yeah. Do you want to talk about that? Well, that everybody ever wanted modification. That's <laughs> 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 Oh, the yeah, yeah. far right is, by the way, is our performance in Mumbai, and we had uh, I made a film of the detail of the detail, and that played behind us as we sang and played. But sorry, I interrupted. Oh no, no, we've just put a uh, uh, a bit more of a dramatic uh, framing collar on the dress, which I think is probably mm -hmm. I, do, I tend to do this, and we get there. Like, oh, maybe we should just do something else. Maybe we should just. I love yeah, that. Add a bit more. I love that. The beautiful <laughs> risk. That's what art is. Art making is the beautiful risk. Because, uh, you know, there's such a fear about not getting things right. There's such a fear around that in Western society. But it's because, I guess, in Indigenous and First Nations people, we've had so long to embed ourselves in the knowledge that sustains our culture that we know that it's okay for things to evolve and to change over time and that we must go with that. Uh, some things need to stay the same, but some things, if they need to change, then let them change. And, and, and is there, a, is there a, a, an arrival point? Maybe not. Maybe these girls, well, you'll have to continue living them out. I mean, I don't <laughs> intend to get any thinner, but that's what Lacey Mack is all about. <laughs> They're all adjustable. Can you see these photos? Yeah, so that's in your workshop. The workshop. And then is that one of your con that's one of your concept drawings, obviously. Yes, yes. yes. The middle one. And Tom, is that you working away? Yes. Out uh, there, that's Tom. And it's Ruby. And Ruby. And Daphne. Beautiful Daphne. She is so good. I wouldn't allow either of my puppies, my fur babies, anywhere near these gowns. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, Daphne's very well behaved. She's done. Here's some more detail here. Um, what's this? This is a the. Well, this is uh, we when we um, what we have to give that people is a specs of the being. So uh, this is something that Becky does do. Uh, she has to draw up every every little detail B and draw it. We have to measure it and get it exactly exactly to send off to the studio and in there to be beaded. So they will follow our. In our aspects, um, we have to choose the beads. We have to do actually everything. So it's not that we just say we've got this idea, we'll send it off to India, and then they'll just do it. That, it's not, not like that. Everything has to be to size, to every bead. So we're really very, very proud of um, what we've been able to do, and they've been able to follow through with us, give us what we want. So this is, and there's a lot on it. Look at all those journey lines, yeah. all those long lines. lines. There's a lot of fabric, and they had about eight. Sit around the table, I think, and they all be and um, do all the lines. So then it comes back to us in the fabric form, which we then have to put together the pieces to create the gowns. And because it's got the tracks and the lines, and the, the circles represent the, the uh, sinkholes and the ceremonial sites of the women, the track, the leading the lines represent the tracks up to the ceremonial sites of the women, which I probably might have discussed about the painting. Um, but that's what they really want. Nice. Oh, and know. the red underneath, the orange earth, is the representing the earth of the red centre. And I think oh, it's about like a little bit more of that feeling around the neck. Around the neck, just to make it a little bit 
would they can get that colour through like the wall mm. up the top is uh, I think it's a good idea because I don't have hair. Uh, the other surprise they have hair, loads and loads of hair, and they do things with that hair. I don't know what it is they do. <laughs> when I have a hair and makeup person come, they come, I'm very serious, they're there an hour and a half before, they look at my hair and with dismay. <laughs> they realise, you know, they, they might have to rearrange an eyebrow or something because nothing happens with my hair. I realise I didn't play the um, I didn't play the excerpt from this, so I'll just go back and I'll do that. So there's a little excerpt from this. This is uh, Rubik's Collective. And on Tabla, Tabla Master, Ashish Sen Senbukta. So that was India, and then came Tokyo, and uh, a wonderful, wonderful collaboration with uh, some very good friends of mine who formed Plexus, and Monica's here tonight as one of the founding members of uh, Stefan Cosmos and Philip Arkansas, the three members of, um, core members of Plexus Collective. And uh, in each country we want to work with a musician who is playing an instrument that is that is deeply linked to that culture, if we can. And so in India we had the tabla master, Nashis, who's very, very famous, can I tell you. Uh, and um, and in Tokyo we had Raison Kuroda, and what a musician he is. Uh, I'll just go to the, um, to the slide, and you can see and hear a little bit of that piece. Very soft, this one. Daisy Andrews didn't grow up on her country. Her, uh, her family were cleared off uh, Lumpa Lumpa country to make way for a communist group. They were murdered. <laughs> cleared off as a polite way of saying they were murdered. And those who escaped, escaped north and uh, went to work, mostly unpaid, on stations. And uh, Daisy didn't get to visit her grandparents' country until she was um, an older woman and she grieved for the loss of the opportunity to visit her country. But her her parents and, and her elders told her, you must go there, you must see it. And she paints this exquisite uh, artwork which is so full of beauty and poignancy. But when she talks about it, she says, the land's empty now. I like to think of when the people were there, but the land is empty now. But I paint that red with the blood of my eldest ancestors who were murdered so that the livestock could be brought through such beauty out of such pain. And when, uh, when I shared that story with you, I knew, Linda, that you wanted to capture that red colour, but you also wanted to capture the vibrancy of the of the wildflowers. I did. I wanted to capture try and the beauty that, that she saw when she went back and she didn't see it as, as as tragic, but she saw its beauty, so that's why she painted. So what we've done with this particular gown is actually embroidered or had embroidered and beaded the flowers that are actually in the painting. So those flowers are the wildflowers or the desert flowers in there, um, at that particular area in that in that painting. So we have some reference over in the, in the boards and 
to actually got images of it where we've done the, we've drawn up the flowers to have embroidered in green, but they're quite large so I can just see that in the on the dress, but beautiful work, all, all, everything was done by hand by these people which are extraordinary, being everything. It's quite beautiful to look at. As, as is the painting, as is the tapestry, the tapestry is so extraordinary. It's exquisite. And it hangs in the entrance foyer at the, um, um, at the Australian Embassy in, in Tokyo. Uh, against a metallic wall, it's quite striking. So when you have that red and that lavender and the flowers, it's this metallic wall. And uh, I think having that relationship, having the real privilege of being able to go there and see them in person really made all the difference for me and then coming back and being able to talk about that experience with Linda. Um, here are some more, this is some more of your development yes. of ideas. So we've got the pearls representing the stars. If you've been to the centre, you'll have seen the stars, like the mm -hmm. stars and millions of stars. It's got absolutely glorious. And the colour, the beautiful blue of the data, um, if you can, and the contrast with the beautiful clear, clear blue sky, the red earth, it's all beautiful. Because the colour's just quite, as you say, very, very vibrant. So that, having been up there and been seen that and experienced it, I felt that's what this dress should be. You see, when we go to the front gallery, that now we have again the neckline. Uh, <laughs> when we're looking at a difficult customer. No, this is your idea. <laughs> this wasn't my idea. This was your idea. This was your idea. You told me this is what you had. It was that what you've done. You to do this. You have created that sky. Yeah. Now the intention, the intention was not to just recreate a replica of the speech painting. That's not it. It is yeah. truly a response. Mm -hmm. But as we, you know, as our relationship with something matures, our response may deepen. It does. And I think it does. We don't have to allow mm -hmm. all our space to it. Mm -hmm. to it. <laughs> I can't be your most demanding soprano. I can't believe that. Very much. <laughs> Close. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. I'm joking. She's, she's that, actually did was fabulous because she just leaves me alone. I just need that dress in three weeks. Yeah, I don't. I, timelines are the. It's like I think the sound to this PowerPoint. <laughs> and so we're doing it at 5 30 in the Yes, it's over there. No, that's right. Well, I well, suppose I can do it. I even had an email from a soprano today later this year. My company, Short Black Opera, is, is presenting uh, the first big work that I wrote, which is Pink and Summer, my first opera. And a lot of the original cast are coming back together. And one of, one of the sopranos, I won't say who, wrote to me today and she said, I haven't wanted to give you my measurements yet because <laughs> I intend to be thinner. <laughs> and if I hear you, so, <laughs> so it's better that we can always take something in. So. Um, when you do the reveal, because this is oh, this oh, is coming up. Okay. So it's coming up. Okay. Next was meant to be China. That's an, uh, a partnership with. Um, so the partnerships to date are with with uh, West Australian Symphony Orchestra String Quartet, who played the premiere in in, uh, in Singapore. They didn't come over for Asia Topa. I'm very fortunate that Monica Kuro and I got together in quartet here. Um, there are a few factors that couldn't um, make that possible. It was our string quartet, Rubik's Collective and Plexus. And the next relationship is the Orchestra Victoria mm -hmm. and an ensemble from Orchestra Victoria. And of course, I mentioned before the concert uh, with MSO, uh, Melbourne Ensemble, coming up in two weeks. But this. Oh, this is gorgeous. No one's seen this yet. I'm nervous. Do you want press it or will I press it? Yeah, I'll press it. Okay. So this is um, the uh, Pedro Bonimieri uh, with the money poles we from up there. Uh, we just felt, yeah, that this this was the fabric that we would use for this. And so um, this has been printed in the TV centre, um, camera, and it's on silk. It looks really difficult to pleat and difficult, difficult to pleat over that sort of kind of screen printing that's really rustic um, screen printing. But it worked out particularly well, so we have it all pleated and we also have it plain and we've just beaded um, one whole piece that oh, we just come back today. Yeah, I, haven't I, I haven't seen that yet. That's, that's exciting. So well, this dress will be 
have played a really great thing and just got to learn to, um, which relates to the story of this and the song that did this. Well, this is for the embassy in, in, in Beijing, which is also a bit of a bunker, I have to say. And uh, we were meant to go at the end of March. Um, there's an invitation to go in June. We may end up going in November. Um, but we will go this year because uh, I, I feel like um, that cultural integrity and that authority uh, and that marriage of the of the arts is so important and it's really important in a, in a culture like uh, not China that went through a cultural revolution where so many things were, um, were forbidden uh, and you know they're not so very different here in Australia. It depends who you are. If you're an Aboriginal person looking at what's forbidden in China, uh, it look, there are similarities for Aboriginal people here in Australia. It's been forbidden us uh, in our expression of culture. But Article 27 states that everyone should be free to participate in the culture of their society. And I think that um, what we're doing is we're amplifying that right through music through the woven form of art, through the painted art, through the incredible design and the reimagining of what that music is going to be, what the art already is, uh, that someone, uh, well, I was going to say someone of, of Lindy's abilities, but I don't know anybody of Lindy's abilities because it really is, when you're left alone with that work of art that has so many layers, with layers yet to come, a piece of music yet to come. It's it's an it's taking on an understanding of conversations that we have mm -hmm. and a trust that we build uh, between all of the all of the the players in in this ensemble. And um, it's just a real honour to have this partnership with you. And the honour to have it with you. Well, with the with the Australian Tapestry Workshop, yeah, you're a visionary, Antonio. You really Absolutely. are. Um, you can't clone people, but if you could, I reckon you'd be you'd be a good one to do because uh, you know arts orgs uh, they do it tough. Everyone does it tough. You know, Australian Tapestry Workshop has a great campaign called Give an Inch. Uh, it's to support this magnificent art form that we associate with Northern um, Europe, but the European houses are looking what we're doing here here in Victoria, in Melbourne, in South Melbourne, on Wollongong country at the Australian Tapestry Workshop. They're looking to here. Gobelin is looking to here. Uh, and when this project is complete, they'll have a lot more to look at and to listen to. So I hope that um, next year, next year in, uh, in the latter part of the year, uh, very possibly early October, uh, at the earliest late September, and you'll be able to hear all 10 compositions and see all 10 gowns. Uh, we're hoping to also curate an exhibition of works of art by all of the artists who created the original works. Um, our performance at the Melbourne Recital Centre over a couple of nights, a festival of woven song, uh, a festival of the designs of Linda Whitman. Uh, floor talks here at the uh, at the Australian Tapestry Workshop to show uh, just how much there is to gain from unsiloing our arts, from um, ending this atrocious practice of pitting artists against one another, forever dwindling amounts of funding. This is one of the most dangerous practices because if I can come back to my original of nuance in our lives and understanding and that art can convey the knowledge and give meaning to our lives. And so we need to protect the arts at every possible turn so that we can live those nuanced lives, develop a mature and an emotionally mature society in Australia that can respond to any challenge and um, we unsilo the arts, we show the true strength of what living an artistic life can be.